Well, once again, Harley, your uh, reputation is on the line for inviting me here. I thank you very much for the book plug. This is my, uh, I think, 12th book, which equals the number of my grandchildren, the latest having been born two days ago uh, in, uh, in the uh, panhandle of Florida. So he's a Floridian from the beginning. I was grafted in. Uh, I do have a unique thing about uh, my books. Uh, I don't know of any other author who does that. I have a money back guarantee. If you do not like the book, I guarantee you not to give your money back. <laughs> so uh, this is a chronicle, as Harley said, of uh, my uh, more than 50 years now as a journalist. It's not a column collection, but it's, uh, it's a reflection on uh, one of the few conservative and Christian journalists in the business trying to hold the standard that most of us of a certain age grew up with. And uh, that standard seems to uh, be increasingly lost in our culture, but it still works for those who try it. And you will see over the years, beginning in 1984 when my column started, uh, how I've done this, and I hope, uh, hope you've appreciated it. I think it'll be my last book, although I do have a title for a book that I really would like to write. The title would be Press One for English. <laughs> <sighs> Don't you love it? And all the recordings, and the call is being recorded for quality and training purposes. You know, I did that one, one time. I, I asked the person on the other end of the line when I finally got to them after five menus. I said, could I talk to the person who's in charge of listening to these recordings for quality and training purposes? And she said, what? I said, yeah, I'd like to really talk to the person who did it. Well, I don't know who that would be. I said, I know why you're doing this. It's so I won't yell at you. <clears throat> all right. Question. Or as they say in New Zealand, question. Only people who know about New Zealand English understand that. Obviously, no one here this morning does. What do professional and even college sports teams do before playing an opponent? They send out scouts to watch the other team play. They take films that show the strong and weak points of the other team so that they can exploit them as they watch the films back in the locker room over and over again. A locker room that now contains men who think they're women. I added that. <clears throat> uh, this is what God has given us in his words. By the way, there's a difference between God's words and God, God's word. God's word is a person who became flesh and dwelt among us. God's words are scripture. Just a little minor thing. You know, I, I have, being a writer, I have little prejudices. For example, using nouns and pronouns in the same sentence. Susan, he. The buccaneers, they. Why do they do that? I don't know. So this is what God has given us in his words. A look at Satan, our great opponent. How he operates and how we can successfully resist him. Even defeat him. The scriptures say, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. How will, he, how will we do that? Singing in a completely different context of what I wish to talk about this morning was Elvis Presley, who labeled a woman who had disfavored him, you're the devil in disguise, so oh, yes you are. That'll be the extent of my Elvis impersonation. You'll have to see the rest in Las Vegas. I doubt Elvis thought much about uh, the theological ramifications of those words, but I have. Elvis sings of the woman, you look like an angel, you talk like an angel, you walk like an angel. This is what Satan does. He is an angel after all, though a fallen one. The devil does disguise himself. He doesn't ring our doorbell and when we answer, he's standing there in a red suit, a pitchfork horns and smelling of sulfur saying, want to go to hell today? You'd slam the door faster than you would if a Jehovah's Witness was visiting. No, 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 no. The first thing we learn about him in Genesis is not that he's evil, but that he's crafty or subtle. He doesn't come at you that way. He comes at you in other ways in your weak spots. Each person has a weak spot, some more than one. And if you're strong at one point, he will leave that point alone and come at you through your weak spot. So he disguises himself as an angel of light, which he once was before attempting to equate himself with God 
and being evicted with other angels from heaven. Imagine, but isn't that what we do? Attempt to equate ourselves with God? Look around at our culture and see what is going on now. It is all about us taking the place of God. Or we're indifferent to him, which is almost as bad. But we take upon ourselves the right to define male and female. We've seen recently that some high officials refuse to define what a woman is. Amazing. Others use varying gender identifications like non-binary, gender fluid, and LGBTQI+. You see it all over entertainment, even in Disney cartoons now, and the Disney Corporation now battling with Governor DeSantis. Now suppose we could see what the tempter of our souls looks like through the eyes of the other side. What if I or you could interview a demon, one of Satan's servants, or Beelzebub himself? Would that not help us mount a better defense against him and his strategies, like a football coach or a baseball manager? That was the premise, of course, of C.S. Lewis in one of his most popular works. Even non-Christians have read it. In an ingenious preface, Lewis purports to be the beneficiary of intercepted correspondence of the diabolical council from a senior devil to an apprentice devil. He labeled this correspondence the screw tape letters. I hope you've seen it performed by Max McLean, and if not, try to go see it should he come to Tampa again or read the book. I'll return to Lewis in a moment, but it seems to me the devil or Satan or Beelzebub engages in at least four acts that are designed to take our eyes off Jesus, the way to live a successful life and the path to heaven. I'm now going to sound like a preacher with a four-point sermon, but it will be short, like all of Elizabeth Taylor's husbands. The first is to deny what God has said heard that in Genesis. The second is to distract us from focusing on God. Look at all the distractions that confront us these days. The third is to deceive us, and the fourth is to destroy God's creation. There was a successful Broadway play some years ago called Doubt. Do I have to explain the plot? From the beginning, Satan denied what God had told Adam and Eve. Did God really say, he questioned, sowing seeds of distrust and doubt in God's character and integrity. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed over the millennia. He does the same today. You hear, well, if there really is a God, why would this happen? The real, you know, somebody, you know, I always say, uh, you know, if there is a God, why do all these good things happen? They never can answer that one. So he sows seeds of distrust and doubt in God's integrity and then says, you won't die. For God knows when you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will be like God. But they were already like God. They were made in his image. The only two, and later when Jesus came at the time, the only two people to walk this earth who were for a time sinless. Think about that. That attitude of equating oneself with the Creator is what caused Satan to fall. His goal is to make us fall, and we will if we pay more attention to him and his ways than we do to God and his ways, which we learn in Scripture are not our ways. In Isaiah 14, 12 to 14, we read this. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Five eyes. That's the middle letter of sin, by the way. Five eyes. It's all about me, not about him. I especially like this verse from Ezekiel 28, 15 and 16. You, speaking of Satan, were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. 
By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. There's an old chorus some of you may be familiar with, sung by Amy Grant, that goes, Are you living in an old man's hovel? Are you listening to the father of lies? If you are, then you're headed for trouble. If you listen to him long, you'll eventually die. But then she sings, if you're living in a new creation, if you're listening to the father of light, then you're living in a mighty fortress and you're going to be clothed in power and might. I love mighty fortress. That was a great hymn sung or written by Martin Luther. A mighty fortress is our God. That's what uh, Billy Graham had engraved over the mantelpiece in his home in uh, North Carolina. A mighty fortress is our God. So do you see the contrast? Light or dark, God or Satan, no middle ground. Whom do you choose and which path will you take? In what may be the most profound example of Satan's power to deny came when Jesus predicted his death and resurrection to the disciples. Peter denied this would happen, prompting Jesus to say, as recorded in Matthew 16, 23, get behind me, Satan, you are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on things of God, but on things of man. Have you ever tried rebuking Satan when you're tempted, not just in some of the obvious ways, but say, I rebuke you in the name of the Lord, not under, under your own power, but under his name. But Satan doesn't always tempt to evil, as with Hitler, Stalin, and a host of other dictators, sometimes he tempts to what seems good to us. But as Oswald Chambers says, the good is often enemy of the best. So Satan is a denier. He's also a distractor. Hmm. How many examples of his distractions do we need? Everybody seems to be on their cell phones. I'll bet most are not reading passages from Scripture. Ever been to a restaurant where a family is together and they got the kids and the kids are looking down at their cell phones and the parents are looking down at their cell phones and some of the kids are texting each other across the table. Nobody's talking to each other. It's the most amazing thing. Sometimes we're distracted by other things. Distractive driving can cause cars to crash and people to be injured. Since I moved to Florida, I have been amazed at how many lawyers advertise on television for uh, accidents, you know. Call us, we'll get you a million dollars. Mm. So Satan wishes to distract us from reading God's words, praying and focusing instead on the world, his world for a time. The more we are distracted from worshiping God, praying, fellowshipping with other believers, the more Satan has our attention. This is why uh, my wife and I listen to the one-year Bible every morning. It is an antidote to what the world is crashing down upon us. It is the truth as opposed to the lie. So just a few verses to get our attention about Satan's playbook. Mark 4:19. But all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the worries of this life, the lure of wealth and the desire for other things. So no fruit is produced. Luke 8, 7, other seed fell among the thorns that grew up with it and choked out the tender plants. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, or as a prominent political leader might put it, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is unusual for human beings, but God is faithful and he will not allow you to be tempted beyond your strength. Instead, along with the temptation, he will also provide a way out so that you may be able to endure it. We get distracted from God by the world, politics being perhaps the most egregious example. I'm always asked, so who do you like in the next election? I said, Jesus, oh, he's not running. I said, exactly, exactly, yeah. <clears throat> Some people seem more enthusiastic about a certain politician these days than they do Jesus Christ. Sadly, this attitude has infected the evangelical community. 
things that were not tolerated by these folks and other presidents of the past seem to be tolerated now, all because of the lure of political power. Now, if political power were everything, don't you think the problems in this country would have been fixed by now? The problems one run deeper. Our problems as Americans, our problem as Floridians, our problem as humans are not economic and political. They're moral and spiritual and must be addressed on that level. And Satan is a deceiver. Have you ever been deceived? I have. Maybe by an ad on TV promising one thing and delivering nothing. Oh, there are so many of those. Shall I name some? No, you know what they are. Or by a friend or relative who promises to pay you back alone, mm -hmm. but doesn't. And you never hear from them again. You're probably familiar uh, with those Nigerians who wanted to transfer large amounts of money into your bank account if you would just give them your account number. There are plenty of other examples, but you get the point. Here are some verses pertaining to Satan as a deceiver. John 8, 44. Speaking of the Pharisees, Jesus says, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. The religious leaders of his day didn't like him talking like that. Second Corinthians eleven fourteen. Even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light, as we heard before. 2 Corinthians 11.3. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, there's another uh, synonym for subtle craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Devotion to Satan is complicated. Devotion to Christ is simple and pure because he made it that way. Ephesians 6.11, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. I love this verse, the full armor of God, helmet of salvation, you know, the breastplate of righteousness, the fast shoes before Nike, and the only offensive weapon, all the others are defensive, is the sword of truth. And last, Satan is a destroyer. You are no doubt familiar with the flood of fentanyl into this country, which is killing hundreds of thousands of Americans, many of them young people. Most of the drugs come from China through Mexico and into our country. China is today's evil empire, though Russia and Iran are also part of what used to be called an axis of evil. Satan destroys in other ways. He destroys male-female relationships in so many ways. Divorce, abortion, living together, STDs, and violence. Crime in our major cities is out of control. It hardly makes the news anymore, unless the number of shooting deaths exceeds a dozen, as it often does in Chicago. There was another shooting at a mall in Texas yesterday. Some guy went wild, eight murdered, number of others killed. Now, the left, the secular progressives, as I call them, say, we need more laws. We need more gun control laws. And I always respond, well, name me a law that a lawbreaker will abide by. The problem isn't that we don't have enough laws. We have many laws in these cities and states designed to control guns, not control the inner, inner person. The problem is that we have a moral deterioration in this country that does not respect life, that does not respect property, does not respect anything. And our institutions are in decline because of that. This is why so many people are getting murdered every day, every night in America. It is a satanic attack on the image of God made in his image. You know that great scene where uh, the uh, Pharisees tried to trap Jesus by asking if it was lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? I love the way he did this. I, I used to do this in debates when I debated on college campuses, but, and that's why they stopped inviting me. Uh, he, he wouldn't answer their question. He would 
do something else, he would ask another question. So he'd say, show me a coin. Well, he grabbed a coin, denarius. Whose image is on the coin? Uh, Caesar's. Well then, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God. And what does that mean? We are made in God's image. His image is stamped on us. We should render ourselves unto him. If we can just get rid of the taxes, that would truly be happy and heaven. So Satan destroys in many ways. In 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Now, C.S. Lewis flips this where the roaring lion is Aslan, a type of Christ. But this roaring lion he's talking about is somebody who's going to attack you if you go on a safari in Africa and uh, you're not properly protected. Sadly, it is not uncommon for people to make either too much or too little of Satan. Again, as C.S. Lewis says, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. You hear a lot about that. Oh, I don't believe this a hell. I don't believe this is a devil. That's all fiction. That just proves that he's making progress with you. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. So I want to repeat what I said earlier. Try this sometime. When you are under temptation, and not just the obvious ones of lust and other things, could be could be uh, attacking another person, thinking ill of another person, uh, taking something from another person. Just audibly say, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus and see what happens. It actually works. It does. Or Jesus wouldn't have told us about it. You know, when there was an argument over the body of Moses, the statement uh, from even Gabriel, I believe it was, I rebuke you in the name of the Lord. There's where the real power comes from. Remember that great line in Chariots of Fire where Eric Little says, where does the power come from then to run the race? It comes from within. Not from within you, but the presence of the Holy Spirit in you. And I hope this analogy of sports contests and scouts looking out for how the other side is playing the game and what their weak spots are and their strong points so they can exploit the weak spots and, uh, and, uh, and defend against the, the strong points will be helpful to you as you confront our great adversary every day and every hour. But greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. His time is short. His end is coming. He has already fallen. And if we focus on the one who is the author and finisher of our faith, we will be victorious as well. Let's pray. Lord, I am dust, and to dust I shall return. I have no power of my own, but you have all power. And I pray that in sharing your words this morning, you will have touched hearts, you will have encouraged believers, you will have drawn people who may not be fully related to the Lord Jesus this morning, to himself. The only answer to our individual and collective problems, the only hope for us and the only hope for our nation and the world, there is no other God. Though we set many up in your place, there is only one, and there has always been one. And so we praise you for that, and we praise you for the truth you've given us, and we love you because you first loved us. And we thank you for your salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Cal. Before you leave, I wonder, we are, we got a few minutes. Oh, a few would, minutes. Would you mind no. telling folks <laughs> about your relationship with Bob Beckles, how you oh. started and uh, what the end of that was and where he is today? Well, uh, Bob was my dearest friend cast himself as a liberal Democrat. Uh, we wrote a column together for 10 years for USA Today called Common Ground, and a book uh, together. Uh, he, he then said, uh, I've now written more books than I've read, which wasn't true, but it was a funny line. And we go out in the lecture circuit for a number of years, and, and I would say things like, you know, can we get away from this other side business? Bob is not on the other side, he's my fellow American. Both of our fathers were in World War II. They weren't fighting for or against Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, 
They were fighting to preserve an ideal. America has always been an idea in search of the ideal. And then at the end, he'd say some nice things about me and how I saved his life and all that. And uh, we'd get up and hug each other. One of the great problems in our country now is we don't see each other as fellow citizens or even fellow human beings. You turn on the television and you see a host and two guests, and one guest is saying to the other, you're ruining America, and the other is, no, you're ruining America. Well, you're a commie. Well, you're a, you're a Bible-thumping bigot. And the host says, and we'll be back with more civil discussion after these messages. That's not the way real people act in their neighborhoods, at their various social gatherings. You wouldn't have many friends if you did that. So we're now all divided into tribes. Instead of our great national motto, e pluribus unum, out of many one, we are self-divided into out of one many. And we are all hyphenated Americans now. This is not what the founders intended. And so I think if we see ourselves as friends and as fellow citizens, because there are so many people around the world who want to destroy us, why are we destroying ourselves from within? And there are people who don't want to uphold our laws and flooding this country with people who are breaking them and don't like America. We need to get to know each other better. And so Bob would always say, uh, uh, go find somebody of a different political or other persuasion than yourself and sit down and listen to them. Don't start talking, but listen to them. And then you will learn the right for them to listen to you. Bob passed away uh, about a year and a half ago, and uh, I keep his picture on my desk. We, uh, we had a unique relationship that surprised an awful lot of people. And uh, I'm very grateful for his friendship, and uh, I, I, uh, I know that he's in heaven. And one of my favorite stories, this is, this is how you change people, not through politics. For years, he used to do a fundraiser for Kate Michaelman of the National Abortion Rights Action League. And one year, Kate called him and said, what are you gonna do for us this year, Bob? And he said, I can't do it anymore, Kate. And she said, Cal got to you, didn't he? And he said, no, Jesus did. And I rest my case. Well, does anyone have any quick question? Bob. Tell us about your last trip to Israel. Ah. Well. Well, I hope it wasn't my last trip, but the previous, it's my 27th trip. I, I'm now honorary Jewish. Um, always love Israel. I mean, it brings the Bible alive when you go to some of these towns that are mentioned, mentioned in Scripture. I had an ice cream cone once in Beersheba. That's in the, that's in the Bible. You know? um, we're going to do, we were going to do some other things, but uh, we decided to stay in Jerusalem. Uh, CJ, it's only her second trip, and there were some things I wanted her to see, uh, the garden tomb, you know, Golgotha, and, and some other things. But um, uh, seeing Bibi again, and uh, I got him to sign his book, uh, which is really good, a very good autobiography, just simply called Bibi. I've known him since he was deputy chief of mission at the Israeli embassy in Washington. And uh, it's a great trip. It takes a while to get there. But if you've never been, I highly recommend it. Get a good tour guide. I've got a recommendation for you if you need it. And uh, it's, it's pretty amazing to walk where Jesus and the prophets walked, to be in towns where, which are recorded in scripture, to realize that this is not something that's just made up, but it's real, real people who lived in real places, who walked real streets. And uh, it's just an amazing place. I never get tired of going there. So thanks for that question. And we also went to Paris, you know, so <clears throat> it was her birthday, so no, April in Paris. <laughs> Anybody else got a question you're just burning to ask? Can we get somebody better next time? I don't blame you. All right. Thanks. Lord bless you.